from Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Mimi Gerges. This is Government Matters, the only show covering the latest news trends and topics that matter to the business of government. I'm Mimi Gerges. The Chief of Staff of the Army, General James McConville, joins me to talk about his top priorities, challenges, and vision for modernizing America's Army. General, welcome to the program. Thanks, Mimi. It's great to be here with you. I want to start with the war in Ukraine. How is the U.S. Army supporting that effort? Well, first of all, what the uh, United States Army is doing is reassuring allies and partners. And we actually surge uh, forces forward uh, to make sure that we could uh, stand strong uh, with our NATO partners. But the other thing we're doing is, is, is uh, working with the Ukrainians, giving them the, uh, the, the weapon systems and equipment that they need, and also helping them with their, their training. So you did deploy uh, Army soldiers out there in Europe. Tell me how many are out there and what are they doing? Yeah, right now we have a little over 48,000 uh, soldiers uh, supporting our NATO partners, reassuring them. And uh, this included uh, two corps for the United States Army, uh, two divisions, and multiple brigade combat teams. And they are training uh, with our allies and partners over there and also reassuring them and providing training to uh, the Ukrainian forces. I wanted to ask you about that training. What kind of training are you involved in? How extensive is it? Well, what we're doing is providing them uh, training along with our allies and partners on, on the, some of the weapon systems uh, that they're getting. We're also providing uh, maintenance training so they can take care of these systems. You know, the president has authorized a lot of military support for Ukraine. Are those stocks being replenished? How quickly? I mean, where are those, you, you know, all those weapons going over there? Are we getting new ones to replace them? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a, a little of all. Um, you know, we're certainly replenishing the stocks. Some of the systems are, are old, older systems, and so rather than, you know, replacing the older systems, we'll buy the newer systems. And, and, and that's been the approach we're taking. But all those, the ammunition and the weapon systems, we're in the process of replenishing. You know, I want to ask you about how Russia has been executing this war, because I'm sure you're watching that carefully as you know, on one side as a potential adversary in the future, and on the other side as just lessons of how not to carry out a war. Yeah, well, we're taking a hard look. We have our Center for Army Lessons Learned over in Europe, and uh, we're, we're watching everything that's going on. And I would say, you know, there, you know this, this, this conflict is not over. It's very, very serious. You know, we're seeing some, what we would say, early mistakes made when it came to leadership, when it came to uh, lo logistics. And, uh, and what we're seeing is, you know, Ukrainians, the, the will of their soldiers is extremely strong. And that has made a, a huge difference in the early part of this conflict. You know, I, I do want to ask you about logistics, because there was some major failures on Russia's part early on as far as their fuel lines and uh, just in general, even getting food to their soldiers. What does that tell you about the U.S. Army's vulnerability? when it comes to operational energy on the battlefield? Well, I, there's an old adage in the United States Army that professionals study logistics and amateurs study tactics. And we take it very, very seriously um, when it comes to you know, energy, energy and, you know, I mean, we want to reduce fuel. And one of the things we want to either make our, you know, our, 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 our vehicles more efficient, whether that's making them hybrid, but you know, very, very concerned about the ability to move logistics on the battlefield. And I would suggest that our Army does that as well as anybody. So what are you doing, though, in response to that? I know that there's a climate strategy. Of course, you know, it's not just about operational energy, but about reducing emissions and, and, and the impact to the environment. What, what concrete steps are you taking? Well, what I'm looking at is how do we make the Army more ready when it comes to our, our war fighting uh, weapon systems. So anything that we can do to the reduce the amount of fuel on the battlefield is to our advantage. You know, having large tankers moving down roads as we saw in, in Afghanistan and Iraq is, is something that we want to reduce because it's the safety of our soldiers. So having vehicles that we're moving forward more on hybrid, you know, we're not at the point where, you know, 
tactical combat vehicles can be all electric, uh, but they can be hybrid, and that can reduce the amount of fuel. It also reduces the amount of noise, which is very helpful for us for our vehicles. For the signature, as far as the adversary knowing where you are. That's right, yeah. They're much quieter in certain capabilities, and, and we can operate them longer. Well, let me ask you about uh, modernization, because this is now a big push for the Army in response, really, to China's modernizing. Tell me where you are on that and some of the challenges that you're facing. Well, the, the Army's on the go in what I would argue is the biggest transformation in 40 years. And I suggest that every 40 years, the Army has to transform and modernize. It did it right before uh, World War II and in the 1940s. We did it when I came in the Army in 1980, and now we're in 2020, and we're doing the same thing. And so it's not just new weapon systems, though that what, 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 what is what a lot of people are interested in, but it's new doctrine, multi-domain operations for us, it's new organizations, multi-domain task forces, the security force assistance brigades, we're changing how we train, taking advantage of the technology, but we're also developing uh, new weapon systems uh, along our six modernization priorities. Well, tell me about some of those new uh, yeah. systems and some of the priorities. Well, the first priority is long-range precision fires, and it starts with hypersonic missile capability, and, and we plan on having that available to our Army uh, next year, which is very fast as far as developing a weapon system. Now, when you say available, yes. do you mean it, it will be fielded and operational at scale? No, what I mean is the, the first battery of hypersonics will be in the hands of soldiers um, by the end of 2023. But, but also, we're, you know, we're developing the capability to sink ships, so we have a mid-range capability. We're developing a precision strike missile uh, that's a land surface-to-surface -surface missile capability uh, that has a range in excess of 500 kilometers that's going to give us the capability to hit land targets and, and very near in the future also they hit targets at sea. Uh, but we're taking a look at, you know, modernizing our um, ground vehicles, our aircraft, uh, very concerned about air and missile defense, especially when it comes to lethal drones. And we're giving the, our soldiers the equipment they need to be more lethal. General, we're talking about hypersonics, and I want to ask you, what capability will that give the U.S. Army, and is it worth the investment? Well, the, the capability it's going to give the U.S. Army is really uh, the, the speed, uh, which is, is in excess of, you know, Mark V, we won't get into the exact speed, but, but, but very uh, fast missile capability. The range is ex extensive, and, you know, we're talking thousands of, of miles capability. And what it allows the, the Army to do is, is to uh, provide a deterrence capability, um, you know, for our adversaries. We have the ability to reach from a very long distance and use the convergence of our sensors to strike targets if required uh, in a, a very quick manner, which I think is very important for and, us. And China has successfully tested a hypersonic weapon. Russia has claimed to have used a hypersonic weapon. Well, we certainly want to have the capabilities uh, that our competitors uh, have, and uh, that we're developing those capabilities. You recently wrapped up a joint exercise called United Pacific. Um, what was the purpose of that, and what was the outcome of the exercise? Well, the, the purpose of uh, these exercises is to work with allies and partners. And for you know, some of our viewers that may not be familiar with the military, it's like scrimmaging. You know, you want to practice um, kind of the plays that you're going to use in the game, and that's how we become um, better trained and, and, um, and, and more ready uh, with our forces and working with our friends in the area. It's, it's very important to have these exercises. You know, I, I don't have to tell you that there's a lot of water out there in the Indo-Pacific, and most people see this as, you know, this is the Navy's game. Yeah. What role does the Army play in a potential conflict in the Pacific? Well, I think, first of all, you know, as we, we, we take a look at even in Ukraine, it, it's really a battle of wills, and it's a battle of the people's wills. And you know, most of the people that in the Pacific uh, live on land. And so there's a role for land forces, uh, whether it's reassuring allies and partners there. Uh, the Army's going to provide long-range precision fires. It's going to provide air and missile defense. It, it does logistics and also provides combat credible ground forces that can work with our allies and partners and conduct uh, any type of combat operations if required. So what new capabilities will the U.S. Army need specifically to fight in the Pacific? Well, one of, the, one of those is uh, a new organization we're calling the Multi-Domain Task Force that has really two primary capabilities, long-range precision effects, which means it does intelligence, 
information operations, cyber, electronic warfare, and space operations. It also provides long-range precision fires, which will include hypersonics, a mid-range capability that can sink ships, then a precision strike missile capability that can engage ground targets or, or soon-to-be ships in the future, along with integrated air and missile defense. And, and I understand you're standing up a total of five uh, multi-domain task forces. How many are active now, and where are they? Yeah, right, right, right now, we have uh, three that are active. Uh, one is at Fort Lewis, one is being stood up uh, in Hawaii right now, and one's in Europe. I want to ask you about the fiscal 23 budget request. Um, you don't have unlimited funds, obviously. You're going to have to make tough choices. Right. What are you going to be giving up? Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, you know, make sure the the Army, we take care of our people. We start with our people. People's the number one priority. And so we're taking a, a hard look at how big the Army should be. Second of all, we've got to make sure that the Army is ready today, so we have to invest in training and flying hours so the soldiers that we send into combat are ready to go and we're doing that. And the third is we have to modernize the Army, which I say is future readiness. And so we're trying to find that sweet spot in each of these areas because we, we, we have the budget we have. You've said this, a quote, we'd like to have a big stick, but if we can't have a big stick, we'd like to have a sharp stick. Exactly. What does that mean in terms of acquisition for the Army? Well, what, what it means is we, we want to have lethal systems. You know, systems, you know, if you think about even with long-range precision fires, if you were a boxer, you want to have longer reach. You want to be able to, you know, reach out further than your adversary can, and, and that's what we want to be able to do. And we're seeing that uh, in, in Ukraine right now. The, the reason the Ukrainians want longer-range fires is so they can reach out and hit their adversary. What do you want to say to uh, your industry partners, the people that are actually making these systems for you? What do you want them to know? Well, we want to know what they're doing is extremely important, and cost, performance, and schedule matters, and there's not a, a lot of extra uh, funding to be had, so we have to be very efficient and very effective with the funds that, that we get, and it's important that we s fill these systems uh, at, 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 in a time of relevance. And speaking of the budget, what do you want Congress to know, the people that are holding the purse strings? Well, I think we're in a very dangerous time uh, in the world right now, and I think that we need to have a very uh, capable military. I uh, grew up in, in an environment uh, with, with President Reagan uh, at my graduation, talked about peace through strength, and I still believe that today, is we need to have a, a strong military, a strong army, and in order to do that, we need to resource it. General, you've said, quote, we are in a war for talent. That's not the typical war that the army is set up to fight. What's going on? What's the problem? Well, we go to war with the Army we have, and uh, the Army is people. And so, you know, we are going after, you know, extraordinary young men and women that we want to serve in the Army. We need high-quality um, young men and women to come to the Army, and so we are actively recruiting them, and we think it, it's a great opportunity. But why, is, a, why have the numbers gone down? Why is there a problem right now? Well, we, we, we take a look at um, the availability of um, Americans can serve. 20, Twenty-three percent of Americans are qualified to come into the military, and so we have to actively go after these young men and women. We have to show their parents uh, that there's a great opportunity. It's a pathway uh, for success, and we want to give them that, um, that opportunity. So what happens if not enough 18 to 24-year-olds sign up for the Army? Does this now affect readiness? Well, it could, and, you know, we, we want to have, you know, to me, quality is more important uh, than quantity. Uh, but we want young men and women uh, to answer the call to service. And more importantly, we think it's a great opportunity for them, a great way to get ahead in life. All right, give me your best pitch. Okay, well, but I, <laughs> I, well I would say that, you know, I take a look at all the, the extraordinary young men and women that I serve with. And, and I, I look at myself. I, I was working for the Quincy Sewage Department when I was 16 years old and got a chance to go to college and got the chance to be the chief staff of the Army. But there's so many examples uh, in the Army of young people, working class people that came in the Army, got an opportunity to get training, to get education, to get discipline. And whether they stay four years or 41 years, it's just a great opportunity. And the other thing I would say is, you know, someday when you're older, people are going to ask you what you did with your life. And if you served, and I get to see the World War II veterans, I get to see the Korean veterans, the Vietnam veterans, and they all pop out their chest and say, you know, I served in the Army, and we want to give you that opportunity. 
What are some of the innovative things that you're doing to enhance your recruiting? Well, one of the things we're doing is we're trying to show Americans what, you know, the Army's all about. You know, some people watch movies and they don't really get an idea of, you know, the, 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 uh, the possibilities there. You can do cyber, you can do medicine, you can do, you know, incredibly high-speed infantry, you can fly in helicopters. There's just so many things that you can do. And so we're even opening up for our posts, which have been gated communities and bringing young men and women in and saying, this is what it looks like in the Army. We're also asking our soldiers that are enjoying the experience go out and talk to their friends and say, hey, this might be something you want to do. You recently returned from a trip to Alaska. What were you doing there? What was that uh, about? Yeah, we went up to, to Alaska to, um, to reactivate the 11th Airborne Division, which was really exciting. Uh, you know, as we look into the future, we see the Arctic as uh, strategic importance, and, and we want to have a uh, unit, a, a division that is trained to operate in that environment, to operate in extreme weather, to operate in high altitude and mountainous terrain. And the, the 11th Airborne Division has a very storied history of valor, which gives our troops something to, uh, to look up to and, and to live the legacy of. But the other thing they have is a a proud history of innovation. They're the ones that helped develop the airborne and air assault techniques, te te techniques, tactic techniques and procedures that we've used. And we expect them to do the same thing for working in the Arctic. I know that you uh, like to go out a lot. You travel a lot. You want to meet soldiers, officers. What is it about that meeting that you enjoy so much about your work? And what do they tell you? Well, I, I just, I. I love soldiers that's why I, I stayed in the army and you just see so many incredible stories about you know what what made you join the army and when you see where they came from and where they are today and the commitment that they make to this country it just makes my heart feel so good about the soldiers that we have serving every single day you're the 40th chief of staff of the army can you tell us a bit about the history of that office and some of your predecessors well, it's a, and I'm very honored to be in this position. When you think about some of the people that have served, you know, General Marshall, General Bradley, uh, General Eisenhower. I mean, I go, go list. There's been 40, and, and, and each one of them has made an incredible contribution uh, to the nation. And you know, it's been around for you know, the position has been around not since the beginning of the army because we used to have the commander of the army, then later became the chief of staff of the army. Uh, but you have an opportunity uh, to man, equip, and train the Army and, and the opportunity to participate in a lot of senior decision-making of, of how we're going to employ the Army, and I'm very honored to be in this role. You also sit on the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, tell us about that. What do you do in that role? Yeah, I, I should have said, like, in the, in the, in the, as the Chief of Staff of the Army, you're mainly concerned with manning, organized, training, and equipping the Army as the Chief of Staff, but you also send the Joint Chiefs where you're involved uh, in, in the planning and the strategy of how we're going to employ the military as a whole and providing that advice to the Secretary of Defense and to the President. Do you interact directly with the President or does that goes through the Joint Chiefs? Well, we do sometimes, but we don't. Normally, the, uh, the Chairman is one that, that, that routinely uh, interacts with the president, but we we do on occasion. We have a chance to talk to them. They come over and they listen to what we have to say, and uh, and, and we do that routinely. You have a four-year term. Yes. What's the most important thing that you want to accomplish before you leave office? Well, the, you know, there's there's really three things. Uh, we want to make sure that we have a high-quality army, and that's why we're actively uh, recruiting extraordinary young men and women, and making sure that we leave the right leaders in place, and we have some good programs to do that. We certainly want to make sure that our army is ready, that, you know, we're going to send soldiers into combat, they're ready to fight and win. And the third is to make sure we're setting up future chiefs and future leaders with the modernization and the equipment they're going to need to be successful in the future. I want to ask about your family, because you have three kids. All three are serving in the army. You have a son-in-law that's also ser serving in the army. And I, you just should have had more kids because you would have solved your recruiting problem well, that way. Right. Well, that's right. That's, that's, I, I think so. But I think, you know, I, I feel very blessed that, you know, my, my, my two sons and daughter chose to serve. Uh, my my son-in-law is serving. Uh, incredible story. You know, someone that came in the Army at 19 got an opportunity uh, to go to college while he was in the Army, went to a program we call Green, Green to Gold, and now he's a second lieutenant in the infantry. And so there's tremendous opportunities for young men and women in the Army.
And we now we just have to wait for your uh, grandkids then. That's right. <laughs> well, we're going to ask everyone else to send their kids too because there's great opportunities here. Absolutely. General, thank you so much for coming in and for making the time for us. Well, thank you, Mimi. It's great to have been with you. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.